Hi, I'm Dr. Cassie from Vetfolio and the host of vet to vet Today, we're discussing ways to help owners with the challenging task of taking care of a diabetic pet. Here to discuss some of the tips and tricks for creating a monitoring and treatment plan that works is Dr. Katherine Scott Moncrief. Dr. Scott Moncrief is a professor of small animal internal medicine at Purdue University. Her clinical interests include internal medicine and endocrinology. Dr. Scott Moncrief, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to have you. Today we're talking about managing diabetic patients, and one of the primary tools that we use is a continuous glucose monitor, um, usually a Freestyle Libre. I understand there are multiple iterations of the Freestyle Libre, and when I call them in, I'm always a little confused as to what the difference is between them. Can you review the types of Freestyle Libre monitors and the indications for each one? Yes, of course. So the Freestyle Libre glucose monitors all measure interstitial glucose, in, and they can be used to measure interstitial glucose in dogs and cats. There are three versions of the Freestyle Libre glucose monitors. The original validated version for dogs and cats was the Freestyle Libre 14 day, and the newer versions are the Libre 2 and the Libre 3. As I said, the Freestyle Libre 14 day has been validated in both dogs and cats in, in peer reviewed publications. So that is the one that we usually recommend. But in some areas of the country, it's becoming hard to find the Freestyle Libre 14 day reader. And in other areas, they're even having trouble finding the sensor. And so people are having to move to using the Libre 2, um, which is very similar to the 14 day, but it has some slight differences, um, differences in Bluetooth compatibility. Um, it looks exactly the same, um, but it has some, the sensor is slightly, slightly different um, and um, it hasn't been validated in the same way that the 14 day sensor has. Um, the Libra 3 um, is just, has just come on the market. I actually have one sitting in my office, which I haven't had a chance to use yet. It just became available in pharmacies. Um, so we don't know much about its performance in dogs and cats, um, but the major advantage is that it's much smaller. So the Libra um, 14 day and the Libra 2 are about the size, a little bit bigger than a quarter. The Libra 3 is the size of a penny. And so um, that smaller size is going to be really great for our smaller dogs and cats. If we can't get a hold of the 14 day monitor, is it reasonable then to go ahead and sub in the Freestyle Libre 2? I think at this point, it's reasonable to sub in the um, Libre 2. Um, but people need to realize that there are some subtle differences. For example, with the 14 day reader, you can place it with, the, you can place the sensor with the reader and then use a cell phone um, for the owners at home. And so because the readers has been unav is become unavailable, we have readers in our hospital, we use them to place the Freestyle Libre and then the owners use their cell phones at home. That doesn't work with the Libre 2 because of the difference in the Bluetooth compatibility. If you place it with the reader, you have to use the reader continually. If you place it with the with a cell phone, you have to use the cell phone. So there are some subtle differences um, between the two. And it's a different sensor, slightly different sensor, with, and we haven't got many publications on it, but overall it seems that people are getting pretty good results with the Libra 2, although there aren't, that, aren't any publications yet. Interesting. Thank you for clarifying that, because I think that's the main question I get when I'm calling them in, is which one do you want? I'm like, I don't know. So that yeah. kind of gives everybody some good options as far as how to answer that question. And in the future, I think we'll um, you know, be looking at the Freestyle Libre 3, and that may end up being our default reader. I'm not planning, I'm planning on evaluating the Freestyle Libre 3 and, and jumping to that if it works well um, from the 14 day once we have some information on the on the on the Libre 3. Very cool. Well, I can't wait to hear more about it, especially the smaller size seems very, very good for our patients. Yeah, yeah. When we call these monitors in, we're kind of asking the owner to jump through some hoops. You know, we call it in, they have to go pick it up from the pharmacy, um, which means they they cost money and then bring it, bring the sensor and bring the pet into the clinic to have this placed. And so, of course, we want to make sure we're doing this right when we're asking an owner to do this, especially, you know, they're going to take them home and monitor the pet. This is going to be a, a be kind of a big thing. So can you share with us your hospital's protocol for placing the Libra? Who places it? How do you get the reader up and running? How do you communicate with the owner? Um, can you kind of run us through all of that? Yeah, so this to for the owners to get the um, reader and the sensor, 
there is actually there are actually two options. They can you can write a prescription and send them to the pharmacy with their prescription. And of course, if, it, if you're buying a reader, you just need to buy one reader, and then for the future that'll last. Every sensor you have to you know purchase another sensor because the sensor only lasts for up to fourteen days. Um, you can also stock these in your hospital. Um, we get you can get them from Cardinal Health and stock them in your hospital. It tends to for us it tends to add little cost, but sometimes owners prefer convenience over cost. Um, so those are two options. And so if we have an owner who we decide would needs a freestyle libre maybe for the first time, the first thing we're going to talk about with them is what the advantages of the technology um, are and um, what the costs are. And then um, if the owners are willing to go ahead with that, then we will um, ask them to either go up and go and pick out the sensor, pick up the sensor from a pharmacy or to we'll provide it from our hospital. And then um, we'll ask them to download the LibReview app. And then um, we can send them an invitation from the LibReview software that invites them to share that data um, with us in our hospital. And so we have a professional account and if they give us permission to, to share that data, then we can go onto any of the computers in our hospital and look at the data as it's as it's accumulated. As far as how it's um, the logistics of placing it, so uh, most of the time it's our veterinary nurses that are placing um, these sensors. You know, I do one once in a while just to keep my hand in. Um, they place it, and basically we'll talk a little bit about the logistics of of placing these sensors. But once you place them, um, the first thing to do after you've placed the sensor is to activate it. And you do that by um, running, swiping or passing the, the, the reader or a cell phone across the placed sensor. And that starts the sensor working, but it takes 60 minutes for the sensor to actually start giving glucose data. And so because of that, um, what we usually do is we'll have the animal in the hospital, we'll up and place it with one of our readers, and then um, we'll wait that 60 minutes make sure everything's working correctly before we send the owner home with the sensor and their cell phone or the reader. Um, because every now and again, we'll have a placement fail and we don't want to send them home until we know that the, the sensor is working after placement. It can be complicated for the owners when you send them that invitation, they have to know what link to pick. And there's quite a few variable, you know, there are quite a few iterations. Some, own, some owners really get it pretty fast, others struggle with that. So actually in our hospital right now, we're working on a handout that kind of walks them through with screenshots, exactly what they're going to see when they get that invitation, which links to pick and, and how to move it forward so that they've got the technology working. Once the technology is working, they seem to have no problems with it. It's that first initiation that can be a little tricky. Sure. I love that you're making a client handout sheet so that they can understand it because that would be me not uh, not knowing where to click or what I was looking at. Uh, and it sounds like, like so many things that once you get everything up and running, it's smooth, smooth sailing, but that initial build out and getting everything working can be really challenging. So I, I think the take home point here is a good emphasis on client communication and making sure they understand how this is going to go and how it's going to work to help avoid some of the frustration that can inevitably come with technology when you don't know how to use it, which is the story of my life. So yeah. And exactly, it's our veterinary nurses actually, you know, who said we need to put together a handout for this because I spend an hour after hours last night explaining things to these owners, and I don't want to have to do that every single time. Well, good for them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I understand you have some video on how to place this monitor. Can we take a look at that? Yes, of course. So the first step is to prepare an area of skin to place the sensor, and we do that by clipping the area and um, wiping it with alcohol and allowing the alcohol to dry. You can also use a skin tack wipe that adds um, some protection to the skin and has also adds a little bit of stickiness. Once the skin has been prepared for placement of the sensor, the next step is to load the sensor into the applicator. And there's very good instructions that come with the, um, with the sensor and applicator, but there are lines that you can see on the applicator pack and on the sensor that you line up and then you push the um, um, applicator down on top of the sensor and that loads the sensor into the applicator. Once the um, sensor is, is uh, loaded into the applicator, you can turn it upside down. You can see the sticky disc that is going to be in contact with the skin. And in the video, you'll see that they put um, a circle of skin glue um, around that sticky part. We've actually tried to decrease the amount of glue so that we actually now do more of like a 
um, clock face of glue rather than a, a whole circle of glue. Um, you want to minimize the amount of glue that you use without having it fall off. So that, that's, that's the balance. You're then going to um, deploy the sensor. And the important things when you deploy the sensor is that you deploy it at 90 degrees to the skin surface and you avoid any kind of bony prominences. If you hit a bony prominence, um, it will bend the needle and that can um, cause failure of the uh, applicator to release the sensor. Um, um, once you've um, deployed the sensor, then you need to separate the applicator from the sensor. And sometimes you need a pair of hemostats just to grab the edge of the sticky disc and hold it down and make sure it doesn't pull away um, with the applicator. Um, and then you're gonna tap down the edges of the sensor patch, maybe add a little bit more glue if necessary. Um, and then at that point, you're ready to scan the sensor with the reader or the cell phone. And once you scan it, um, um, sometimes you'll, um, it'll say, you know, do you want to scan, to, do you want to add a new sensor? And you say yes, and then you pass the uh, the reader over the sensor, and then it'll say ready to read in 60 minutes. And then at that point, we're going to put the animal in a cage, we're going to wait and double check that it's still working after 60 minutes, and then the owner can take the animal home. Um, and, you know, you have to decide whether or not you're going to protect that sensor with a jacket or with um, a skin grip patch or a thunder shirt or whatever. And that's really patient dependent. Sure. I was going to say when you said then, you know, we put them in a kennel and we wait for 60 minutes. I was going and ideally they don't chew the sensor out in the meantime. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And some older dogs really leave these alone. You know, some yes. older dogs that, you know, have coffee table backs, they don't even notice. And, and it's sometimes fine to leave them unprotected. But in a younger dog or a wiggly dog or in households where there are other dogs, they, the other dogs will kind of grab onto them and remove them. So um, every animal is going to be a little bit different. The skin grip patches really, that they're made specifically for the Freestyle Libre and they fit really nicely over it and they work really well in dogs. And cats, I find they kind of annoy the cats and they start okay. working at them. So I don't tend to use the skin grip patches as much in cats. And cats will typically use a protective t-shirt um, or thunder shirt, something like that. Absolutely. That's interesting. I've done the t-shirts, but I've never done the skin patch. So um, I'll have to give that a try. The skin grip patches, they come in, in um, rainbow colors. So you can even color coordinate with your, uh, with the harness or, you know, whatever the pet, whatever color the pet likes or the owner's like. I love that. That's, you make it a little more fun to monitor diabetes here. Yeah. Coordinate with the, with the ribbons in their hair, you know. <laughs> perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Well, you know, talking about doing this monitoring, now we've got our sensor placed, it's working, the pet is not trying to chew it out, and the owner's able to keep an eye on these numbers. What are you looking for when we start to get these data points back? What types of parameters, either numerical or otherwise, do you feel indicate that our diabetic patients are controlled? Yeah, so the most important parameter, of course, in any diabetic is to evaluate whether the clinical signs are controlled. So we're going to look at the clinical signs um, together with the blood glucose numbers. Um, and when you look at the reports that you get with the Freestyle Libre um, monitor, um, you get a lot of data and you have to figure out what's the most important data. And so it's still really like looking at a blood glucose curve, except you have 14 days of blood glucose curves if you if, if these sensors stay on for that long length of time. So we're going to be looking at the nadir how low does the blood glucose go? And we're going to be looking at the duration, how long is the insulin lasting? And we'd like to have the blood glucose nadir in the 80 to 150 range, but that is a little bit patient dependent. It depends on, you know, if you have a cat that you think might go into diabetic remission, you maybe want to have slightly lower numbers than a canine diabetic that you know is permanently diabetic. Um, so 80 to 150 is, you know, is the range, but every, every patient's going to be a little bit different. And then we're going to look at the duration of the effect. And ideally, of course, you'd like to have the blood glucose um, below 300 milligram per deciliter for the duration between insulin doses, which is you know, typically 12 hours. Um, but if you can keep the blood sugar below 300 for the majority of that time period, that will typically equate to good control of clinical signs. And if, the control, if you have that and the clinical signs don't look well controlled, there's something, there's, you know, something not, not right. Um, so, um, so we're going to look at um, the insulin, insulin. Um, sorry, blood glucose nadir, insulin duration, and then we can use the reports from the Freestyle Libre um, sensor to also look at other things like day-to-day -day variability. 
And that's one of the powerful things about this, this um, technology is you can look at multiple days and you'll realize how much day-to-day -day variability there is normally in any diabetic patient. And you can get some statistics on, you know, how many times do you see a, a evidence of hypoglycemia? How many times is the blood glucose way above the target range? And then you can use the, that data to decide whether or not you need to adjust the insulin dose up and down or whether or not you maybe need to change insulins. Okay. And um, when you say, if you have all of these things exactly where you want them, the numbers are working out and you don't have good control of clinical signs, then something is wrong. Um, so potentially looking into like a comorbidity or something along those lines. Right. For example, what if you have a diabetic dog that's also cushionoid and the, and the PUPD is coming from the Cushing's? Um, yes, I'm, I feel like I've had that cycle. conversation talking yeah. to internists where they've said, well, what if he's also Kushnoid? And I said, but I don't want him to be Kushnoid. That will make it more complicated. Exactly, exactly. Absolutely. Well, in thinking about the diabetic patients that I've treated, it would be so nice if we could say your, your pet is diabetic, we could start insulin, and then boom, we get nice diabetic control, maybe with a little bit of adjustment here and there. But personally, I've found that that's not always the case, and we have to make some lifestyle changes as well. So can you talk about some of the ancillary things that we can do in addition to insulin therapy to help our diabetic patients regulate as quickly as possible? Yeah, so there are lots of other aspects of diabetic regulation. You know, insulin's not the only thing, right? So um, dietary modification um, is really important. That depends on whether it's a dog or a cat. So low carbohydrate diets in cats, um, higher fiber diets usually in dogs. Um, controlling obesity, um, increasing exercise, routine exercise. Um, and then as far as diet in diabetic dogs and cats, you know, cutting out high, high calorie treats, you know, making sure they follow recommendations about the number of meals um, so that they're consistent in the meals from um, day to day is really important. And then ruling out other illnesses, as we talked about the complicated diabetic control. So um, in cats, you know, um, recurrent pancreatitis is a huge issue in dogs. Um, looking for underlying Cushing's in poorly controlled diabetic dogs is going to be really important in both species, bacterial infections, and of course, particularly of the urinary tract um, are going to be something we're going to look for. The type of insulin and dose can also make a difference. If the insulin does not last long enough due to rapid metabolism, or if the insulin dose is too low or too high, this can cause problems of diabetic regulation. For example, insulin-induced hypoglycemia can actually worsen diabetic control. Lastly, it is really important to make sure that owners are well-informed on how to store and administer insulin and how to recognize clinical signs of hypo and hyperglycemia. Well, talking about this technology, and like you said, a very powerful technology that can give us a lot of really necessary, really useful data, it seems like there's a lot of pros to using a Freestyle Libre. Can you compare it to the traditional glucose curve? I know you brought that up earlier. So I was just kind of interested in the differences and pros and cons between the two. Yeah. So, um, you know, a couple of, we've really talked about the pros. It's a very powerful technology. Um, we get lots of data. Um, and so um, it really is important that the veterinarian and the owner understand that data and so um, it's easy for the owner for the owner to overreact to every little change in the blood glucose. Um, so that's one thing to, to be concerned about. Um, the blood glucose does fluctuate and that can sometimes, the amount of fluctuation can panic owners. Um, and the other thing that you need to be aware of is that there's a difference between the interstitial glucose and the blood glucose. They're not identical. And one, the interstitial glucose typically lags behind the blood glucose. So if the blood glucose is changing very fast, the interstitial glucose will um, have a will not be quite as close to the blood glucose as it would be at the steady state. And so that can lead to some inconsistency. So you know, um, you, if you if owners are checking with an alpha track, for example, the number may not may not be identical. Um, and then we do have er um, sensors that fail. We have sensor errors. Um, so if the circumstances where the data you're getting doesn't make sense, you kind of have to know when to think about that. We can see that in dehydrated patients. Um, we can see that when the sensor is starting to fail, you'll start seeing um, weird numbers. You'll maybe see the blood glucose fluctuating up and down um, when you haven't done anything to change the blood glucose. So, you know, so there are things that can trigger 
um, someone who's familiar with the technology to say that looks like the sensor's failing. The other thing we'll see is gaps in the data so that you know it's not you don't see a nice steady line you see you know times when the when the sensor's not recording like you said familiar with the technology i'm glad that you bring that up so we know what to look for it makes me think of like monitoring anesthesia or monitoring blood pressure while a pet is under anesthesia when you just you know sometimes you just get some weird numbers where you're like that's not consistent with what i'm seeing here and you know maybe you need a different cuff a different machine and so it sounds like a similar looking at the whole patient type of concept. Exactly. I think you put it absolutely, um, uh, hit the nail on the head, Kathy. And I think that one of the things you have to realize is that um, the more data you have, the more room there is for, um, you know, things to not be correct. And so you have to have an index of suspicion. Yes, this doesn't really quite fit. Um, you know, an example of that is that one of the great advantages of this technology is it's much more sensitive to detecting hypoglycemia, because you can imagine you're you're monitoring the blood glucose for 24 seven for up to 14 days. And so it's much more sensitive for detecting episodes of hypoglycemia. Um, but there is a little bit less accuracy at the lower end of the range. And so you have to know how when to worry about, you know, if you just see one small episode of hypoglycemia, that's probably not something to worry about. If the blood sugar, if the interstitial glucose, sorry, is, is running in the um, 40s, then that's really an indication you need to decrease the dose. Um, so kind of interpreting through that, not panicking when you see one small episode of hypoglycemia, but realizing if you have profound hypoglycemia, that can really cause poor diabetic control and obviously increase the likelihood that animal's gonna end up in the emergency room. See, I love these talks because I've used freestyle Libre monitors, I, I feel like a fair bit where I have some familiarity with them. And I still learn so much when I sit down and have these talks as far as what to look for and what might be a false reading and when to worry. So I appreciate you going through all of this with us. A couple of key points. I mean, the technology is always evolving. The reports are changing. They, the, the company changes how the reports look all the time. You know, the sensor technology is evolving. Um, and so, yes, it's something you really have to kind of stay on stay on top of as far as what's, what's, what's happening in this space. Um, Absolutely. So it sounds like you do have to be aware of potential issues and look at your whole patient, but there's a lot of pros to reaching for a Freestyle Libre. Are there cases where you should definitely use a Libre and avoid a glucose curve or, or the opposite, cases where you absolutely should not reach for a Libre and you should do a glucose curve instead? Well, I have to say that I think there are very few circumstances when a, blood, a traditional blood glucose curve is going to be the, 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 treat, you know, the monitoring tool of choice. Um, we can use this technology in newly diagnosed diabetic patients. Um, it's very helpful so you can adjust, carefully adjust the insulin in those first few days. You don't want to adjust the insulin um, too rapidly. So you want to wait, you know, five to six days, and then you might want to adjust up. Adjust up. Of course, if you document hypoglycemia, you can adjust down. Um, in any unstable diabetic patient, these are just critical. So the patients that have, you know, pancreatitis, and you're trying to get them through that pancreatitis, and you may be needing to adjust the insulin on a, you know, on a daily basis under the, under the care of a veterinarian. Um, very important not to let the owners just go up and make decisions on their own. Um, we can use this in diabetic ketoacidotic patients with the caveat that be a little careful when the patients are dehydrated because dehydration can make it, make this technology less accurate. And then we can use it like a traditional blood glucose curve where one might recommend a blood glucose curve every three months or three to six months. Instead of doing that, you place a freestyle Libre. Um, the main times that we don't do that are when owners say, well, we did this and it didn't work. Um, and I think people get, you know, if it doesn't work the first time, the, you know, the, the sensor fell off, they get, you know, put off by the technology. And I think that you can sometimes say, okay, well, we could do a blood glucose curve. Um, but, you know, the other thing you can do is just try this technology again. We're kind of moving forward in, in keeping the sensor on and the, and the technology is evolving. Like you said, it's evolving. I feel like when it first became available, wasn't it a 10-day monitor and there was like a 12-hour waiting period? That's right. Yes, it, that's correct. Yes. And so some of the old videos that are out there, 
um, on the internet are regarding that technology. So it really is changing, changing all the time. And there are some veterinary monitors on the horizon too. So, you know, we may be moving on from the Freestyle Libre to some veterinary specific um, interstitial glucose monitors in the future. That would be so cool. <laughs> Very much. Well, can we talk about some case examples uh, as far as using continuous glucose monitoring? Um, can you talk about some success stories you've had or, you know, maybe even some cautionary tales? Yeah, just a couple of cautionary tales, I think, from the point of view of general use. It's important that the owners understand that the Freestyle Libre is recording the glucose all the time. Not, and they're not just, it's not just recording when they swipe. So this is recording all the time. Um, but um, they do need to swipe the, the reader or cell phone over the center every eight hours or the data will get overridden. So that's the minimum. They have to they have to do this every eight hours. If they want to do it more multiple times, that's fine. Um, but sometimes owners get kind of obsessive with it and they're just swiping and looking at the glucose concentrations all the time and they're staying up all night worrying about it. And they have to realize it's being recorded whether or not they, they swipe or not. Um, so that's an important thing. And sometimes you just have to tell the owners, you know, you really need to give the owner a break, the animal a break. Let's take this meter off. You know, we've got the information we need. Let's take the, the, the monitor off for a few days. So those are some general sort of cautionary tales. Um, one example um, I can show you here is a cat that came in for suspected insulin resistance. And um, the cat was doing very well at home clinically, but the owner was concerned about these really high numbers glucose numbers they were getting when they checked it using an alpha track in the morning. So all we really did was do some basic blood work and place a freestyle Libre. And what we found is that although the cat had high blood glucoses in the morning, it was actually having pretty significant hypoglycemic episodes during the nighttime. And that was actually what was causing the high morning glucoses. And of course, nobody does a blood glucose curve in the middle of the night. So it's one example is it's um, a great technology to, to evaluate animals that maybe have something different going on in the day than is going on at night. So Interesting. Yeah, so that's one example. Another example is it's a really good way of picking up rapid metabolism where the insulin just isn't lasting long enough. And on this particular um, Freestyle Libre report, you can see that the insulin's only lasting about two to three hours of the day. And so that means that the animal is still having pretty marked clinical signs of, of um, diabetes. This Freestyle Libre daily log shows a cat who has excellent control of their diabetes. This should be a cat that you monitor for the possibility of diabetic remission. This daily log shows a dog on once daily prozinc insulin. And you can see that although the blood glucose is a little above the reference range during the day, in the evening, late afternoon, evening, and overnight, the blood glucose concentrations are very well controlled. Very cool. I mean, it a lot of things caught on these monitors that, you know, maybe we wouldn't have been able to catch in the past just on our traditional glucose curves. Right, exactly. And the other really powerful um, place for this in cats that you're monitoring for possible diabetic remission. Um, so, you know, this can really help you figure out um, when you do a blood glucose curve, you know, is the other high numbers you're seeing in the hospital just a result of stress? And maybe the blood glucose is a much lower at home. And so in cats that you think are going to the diabetic remission and having one of these freestyle Libres in place can help you detect those blood sugars going down as and, and the need for decreasing the insulin dose or even stopping insulin therapy. Absolutely. I'm thinking back to before we had this technology and trying to do glucose curves on the cat that didn't want you to touch him and going, how is this even close to accurate? So a much better clinical picture. Yeah. One of the things we should say is that, you know, it, the Freestyle Libre 14 day implies that the sensors are always staying in place for 14 days. And that's not the case. On average, they stay in place in dogs for about 12 days. And in cats, it's a little bit shorter. Um, on on average, eight days of, of, of recordings is the most you're going to get in cats. But there's some evidence that cats get used to wearing these or owners get used to keeping them on because some cats, when they've had multiple sensors, seem to keep them in place longer, which is, I think is kind of interesting learning curve. That is interesting. And that's what I was going to ask you. Is it that the sensor is falling off after that period of time or is it just that the animal will no longer tolerate it or a combination of the two? Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's that the sensor just fails. 
but more commonly in cats is they just start nibbling at it, trying to get it off, um, and um, and it's that they remove it. So that's the most common in cats. They start being cats. They start being cats, yes. <laughs> well, Dr. Scott Moncrief, this has been a great discussion. I've learned so much. Thank you so much for joining me. It was a pleasure. It was lovely to talk with you, Cassie. And thank you to Beringer Ingelheim Animal Health for sponsoring this edition of Vet to Vet. Check out vetfolio.com for more of our B2B discussions on various topics in veterinary medicine. And remember, if one animal is better off because of you today, it's a great day. Important safety information. Prozinc, protamine zinc recombinant human insulin, is for use in dogs and cats only. Keep out of reach of children. Animals presenting with severe ketoacidosis, anorexia, lethargy, and or vomiting should be stabilized with short-acting insulin and appropriate supportive therapy until their condition is stabilized. As with all insulin products, careful patient monitoring for hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia is essential to attain and maintain adequate glycemic control and to prevent associated complications. Overdose can result in profound hypoglycemia and death. The most common adverse reactions were lethargy, anorexia, hypoglycemia, vomiting, seizures, shaking, dogs only, diarrhea, and ataxia. Many of the adverse reactions, such as lethargy, seizures, shaking, and ataxia are associated with hypoglycemia. Glucocorticoid and progestin use should be avoided. The safety and effectiveness of prosing in puppies, kittens, or breeding pregnant and lactating animals has not been evaluated. Prosing is contraindicated during episodes of hypoglycemia and in animals sensitive to protamine zinc recombinant human insulin or any other ingredients in prosync. For full product information, please refer to the package insert.